Hi everyone, welcome to the second video of a series of videos carried out by uh, TCS Online in lieu of the operational case study happening in May and August 2022. Uh, so before I commence with this uh, session, let me uh, highlight about the four videos which we are uh, preparing uh, for this time's case study. So video number one will be uh, focused upon the uh, introduction or will consist of information pertaining to an introduction to the considered company. In this video, video number two, I will be uh, taking you through the internal dynamics of the company operations. In video number three, uh, I'll be carrying out an industry analysis and in video number four, I'll be taking you through the financial statements, thereby car carrying out a financial analysis. Having said that, let's look at uh, the internal dynamics of the operation, uh, uh, internal operations of the company or the internal dynamics of the considered company. Um, right, so first things first, we are looking at uh, um, sales, uh, of the market as well as what type of sales channels. So we are looking at sales and marketing you know, information pertaining to sales and marketing happening within the company. Meals at home sells meal kits directly to customers. So as I highlighted in video number one, this is a B2C company. Since this is a B2C company, um, you need not be too concerned about receivables because uh, there won't be any receivables when usually when um, any company is conducting a B2C business to consumer uh, operation, definitely um, you will see cash sales. So receivables won't be uh, part and parcel of the company. And we are selling to customers throughout Newland. Newland is our considered uh, country in which we operate through the company's subscription services. So in video number one, I uh, spoke about the type of subscription services the company is offering. And uh, I'll be highlighting these points later on in this video itself. And there are six box options available. Uh, we are selling six box options. So that's exactly what you can see here. I've provided a summary uh, in here. So uh, these six uh, box op options consists of three small portions as well as three large portions. So uh, in the small package, you get uh, uh, four portions, uh, which is the highest price package. There's a six portion option as well as an eight portion option. And uh, in the large package, you get eight portions, 12 portions and 16 portions. So that's what you need to uh, remember. Uh, and uh, we are offering promotional discounts as well when we are selling our products. So the first box, when a customer is ordering the first uh, meal kit box, they'd get a 50% discount. And for the next two boxes, the company is offering a 30% discount. That's uh, uh, you know given to make sure that we retain customers uh, with the company. And um, the full retail selling price of each type of box as advertised on the company website before any promotional discount. So uh, we are uh, you know, displaying the prices of meal kits on our company website and the prices displayed are before discounts and uh, the average price per portion is provided. So you can see that our meal kits are ranging from uh, $3.75 to um, $7.5. So that's what you can see. And when you look at the large meal kits, the prices are comparatively lesser. Why? Because um, we can uh, achieve bulk discounts, economies of scale advantages. So we, and, and, and on top of that, when we are uh, charging a lesser price, uh, since we are involved with the quantity game, I highlighted about this point in video number one. I said, given the low margins within the uh, uh, industry, any company, which is providing meal kits needs to focus on selling um, a higher quantity of output. So with that in mind, it's much more profitable for us if we can sell large meal kits. In order to attract customers towards large meal kits, definitely we have to reduce our prices. So that's exactly what you can see in here. Uh, then looking at the recipes, uh, I've provided again, provided a synopsis into all this information. Uh, we have uh, 300 recipes in our portfolio. 
and these recipes are uh, rotated every two weeks or updated uh, every two weeks. Uh, so in a given week, you would see 50 recipes and these recipes will be changed um, in another two weeks time. And uh, when we are providing recipes, there is a seasonality in recipes. So P1 related areas pertaining to forecasting techniques will be definitely tested. Uh, again, there's absolutely no uh, uh, nothing to worry about, uh, you know, uh, the type of questions you would face within the exam because I've uh, prepared uh, mock exams uh, covering all forecasting techniques which can be tested at the operational case study level. And uh, the food ranges which we are offering uh, is uh, we are offering uh, a meat range, a fish range, as well as a vegetarian range. And as I highlighted in video number one, we are not offering a vegan range, uh, which is actually an opportunity which we can use uh, when it comes to expanding our sales. And um, some information has been provided about the subscription service as well. This is how customers can uh, end up purchasing from us. Um, uh, the you know enrolling with the subscription service, it's uh, it carries free membership. You any customer can uh, enroll with the uh, subscription service free of charge. And customers need to order three days before delivery. Uh, you might be wondering as to why uh, customers are supposed to. Uh, order three days before, but in video number one, I highlighted about the ordering process. And uh, in that it was highlighted as to why customers are supposed to order three days prior. Or uh, customers have the option of changing the order or canceling the order again, that everything needs to be done, whether, whether it, uh, it is about amending the order or canceling the order, that needs to be done three days before delivery and um, they can edit preferences when needed. That's exactly what I highlighted right now. And uh, uh, we are looking at how these meal kits are sold. So the company uses a website as well as their own application. Um, so as I highlighted earlier, this company is involved with uh, uh, providing all their services digitally. So you can see that uh, digitalization has been pursued since inception. The company started in 2012. I highlighted this point in video number one. And since inception, the company has been uh, uh, you know, pursuing digitalization. Why? Because uh, the two founders were young when they were 2012, uh, when, they, when they started the business in 2012. So because of that, they'd have a positive attitude towards digitalization. And on top of that, one of the directors come from an IT background and he still believes in continuous innovation as well as adoption of um, um, improved technology to improve efficiency within the organization. So um, uh, that's why these guys had adopted uh, digitalization fully. Right, then uh, let's uh, look into the information pertaining to the production facility. So we looked at sales and marketing, how sales and marketing occurs, the type of uh, products these guys are selling, at what price, the type of discounts they are offering, and um, what uh, they are trying to uh, uh, provide to customers, all this information we looked at. Now let's look at the production facility. Okay, so in the production uh, facility, uh, there is a temperature controlled warehouse where packaging and storing uh, occurs. And there is a separate production area as well where assembly of meal kits happen. So as I highlighted in video number one, if I reiterate about the uh, process or the uh, internal operations of the company, these guys are getting uh, ingredients from third parties and uh, what they do is what what meals at home is up to is uh, you know packing or, or assembling these uh, uh, ingredients together, packaging these in ingredients together, and selling it to the general public. So uh, they need a temperature controlled warehouse because they are dealing with food ingredients. Uh, uh, there are three different types of uh, ingredients which these guys are dealing with, especially. Uh, out of the three ingredients, two types of ingredients uh, has uh, short expiry dates. Uh, so there's a risk of obsolescence. So because of that, uh, we need temperature controlled warehouses. So that's all good. Uh, and packaging and storing is uh, carried out 
um, uh, um, or, or, or when, when it comes to uh, packing our meal kits or storing our meal kits, uh, uh, we use uh, temperature controlled warehouses and there's a separate production area uh, within the production facility itself. And this production area is used to assemble meal kits. Um, and uh, since we are uh, operating our own uh, production process, definitely property, plant and equipment will be there. So IAS 16, uh, property, plant and equipment, your knowledge pertaining to IAS 16, property, plant and equipment will be tested. Then uh, let's look at the type of ingredients used within the production department. So as I told you earlier, there are three different types of uh, ingredients, long life ingredients, um, actually speaking, um, 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 yeah, three different types, long life ingredients, fresh ingredients and chilled ingredients. I've considered both fresh and chilled ingredients together um, because these are similar type of ingredients. So let's look at the long life uh, ingredients. Uh, these are the type of ingredients which are used heavily within our meal kits. And these are purchased in uh, bulk at a discount. So it's actually beneficial for us to, you know, purchase these things in bulk because we get a bulk discount. And uh, this type of inventory is held for long time periods. Uh, however, the risk of obsolescence must be managed. We need to keep a track of uh, the expiry dates. Uh, of these long life raw materials or actually speaking in ingredients. And uh, when looking at the fresh and chilled ingredients, uh, these are purchased based on customer orders because we can't keep them uh, within our warehouses for a uh, long time because these are perishable items and these are purchased daily based on next day's requirements. So we always need to, on a daily basis, we need to keep a track of uh, order placements focused on the next day. That's exactly why the company says that if you are after a customer places an order, if the customer wants to edit the order or cancel the order, they need to do it three days before delivery is made. Why? Because the, cust the company needs to keep a track of the type of ingredient requirements fresh and chilled ingredients required to feel, fulfill orders in the next day. So that's exactly why they are sticking to uh, that type of a time period, three days, they are giving three days uh, for a customer to edit or cancel the order. Um, so a question pops up in my mind, can a just-in-time system or a JIT system uh, be used when dealing with fresh and chilled uh, ingredients, uh, which might lead to improved efficiency? Uh, be prepared to discuss the pros and cons uh, at the exam pertaining to us adopting a JIT system rather than sticking to the normal uh, stock management systems within the organization. So I've made a general comment as well. We need to ensure that the quality of, uh, need to ensure about the quality of supplies uh, because um, as I told you earlier in video number one, the quality or the reputation of our company is uh, based on the quality of ingredients which we are using. When we looked at the ethos of the company, the company believes in uh, the quality of ingredients. So because of that, uh, in order to maintain the quality of supplies, we need to pursue collaborative supply relationships or partnerships at all times. And um, uh, let's have let's look at uh, information pertaining to uh, pertaining to the type of suppliers we are dealing with. Uh, we are dealing with many suppliers. We have excellent relationships with them, and we are trying our level best to source from within Newland. Why? Uh, because as I highlighted in video number one, uh, this company believes in sustainability. They are focused on reducing carbon emissions, mainly uh, focusing on reducing. Uh, 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 kilometers traveled or, or the distribution, uh, the distance uh, 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 when it comes to distribution. So because of that, uh, this company is hell bent on purchasing uh, their food stuff or ingredients from suppliers within Newland. And the payment terms expected by these suppliers are ranging from 30 to 60 days. However, when looking at the payable days of the company, Meals at Home, we generally take 109 days to repay our suppliers. So this is actually bad because when the, if I said that it's of utmost importance that we have 
collaborative supplier relationships. Why? Because the reputation of our company depends on uh, the quality of ingredients. So if we want to make sure that we are getting the uh, best quality ingredients, we need to have good relationships with suppliers. So we can't maintain good relationships with suppliers when our payable days are 109 days, uh, whereas the suppliers are asking to uh, asking us to repay them within 30 to 60 days. So we have to fix this problem. I will be highlighting this point in depth uh, in our fourth video when I'm conducting the financial analysis. And this can affect our payable days can affect relationships negatively uh, in the future, supply relationships negatively in the future. So the general comment is uh, on top of all this information, unethical behavior of suppliers affect our brand reputation. Why? Because if now, for instance, if they are using uh, underage labor and if customers or the market gets to know about it, then uh, our reputation is on the line. And on top of that, treatment of suppliers, employees should be in line with ethical guidelines. We have to make sure that our chosen suppliers treat their own supplier, uh, their own employees uh, in an ethical manner or else it might uh, work against uh, the brand identity or the brand reputation of meals at home. Right, so uh, let's look at the production process. Um, and um, when looking at the production process, it is divided into three main areas. That's what you need to remember. You need to remember these three areas. So we have, as I told you earlier, we have our own production function. And this production function is divided into three main areas. Uh, there's a separate area which handles herb and spice pack production. So we need herb and uh, uh, spice packs to be included as part of our meal kits. So herbs and spices are purchased in bulk. Um, so we get bulk discounts when dealing with these types of uh, um, uh, inventory. And individual um, and mixed portioning is pursued. So there are individual portions as well as the, there are certain portions where uh, the company is mixing herbs and spices. And uh, when it comes to uh, herb and spice packaging, biodegradable packages or, or packing is used. Why? Because we believe as a company, we believe in sustainability. And when it comes to the second part of the production process, that's where milk kit bag production happens. So uh, first things first, we looked at uh, the herb and spice pack production. In the second part of the production process, meal kit bags are produced. In video number one, I spoke about the type of bags used and uh, what contains within a meal kit bag. Um, a meal kit bag contains uh, long life ingredients. Uh, and when it comes to assembly of these meal kit bags, we are using an automated production line. So we can uh, assume that there's utmost levels of efficiency uh, within this automated production line and the bags are produced a week before dispatch. Again, you can see that we are not holding on to too much of stocks when it comes to meal kit bags. Uh, we are focused on what we need to produce um, to fulfill orders uh, in the upcoming week. And the third part of the production process is with regards to box packing. This is where uh, the meal kits are assembled and these meal kits are packed four hours before dispatch, uh, four hours before it is dispatched to uh, uh, the delivery service providers and packaging is done mostly manually. So what you need to understand is out of the three functions, the meal kit, product, meal kit bag production function, um, uh, you know, is using an automated production line. However, when it comes to box packing, uh, we are still doing it in a manual uh, manner. So in your exam, there could be a scenario where we are adopting automation within our box packing uh, operations. And uh, based on that, the examiner can throw questions at you. So remember, our production process consists of three main areas, herb and spice pack production, meal kit bag production and box packing and box packing is carried out in a highly manual manner. Right, and uh, more information pertaining to the box packing process has been provided. So I've uh, taken out the most important points. 
uh, when it comes to box packing, a mix of robots, machines, and humans are used. Uh, so we are using robots, machines, as well as manual labor. And there's heavy use of technology and information systems because we are using uh, barcodes to keep track of uh, the different types of packages and the different types of packages which are included within um, uh, meal kit boxes. And on top of that, uh, we are using robots within um, this uh, uh, process. And uh, packers must maintain utmost levels of quality because at the very end of our production process, uh, you get packers. And when it comes to packing, uh, we handle it in a totally, uh, or, or majority of the processes are done uh, manually. So in such a context, packers must maintain utmost levels of quality. And in order to maintain utmost levels of quality or in order to ensure that our packers adhere to our quality guidelines, we have to regularly train our packers. So there could be a question about uh, training and development or the training cycle. And, uh, you know, we can consider automating this process as well. Um, if so, definitely there will be redundancies. So you need to have a good understanding about how to manage redundancies in the most ethical manner. Again, I've uh, prepared questions pertaining to the training and development cycle and uh, how to manage redundancies ethically in our mock exams. Right, then, um, you know, we looked at the box packing process and we are specifically looking at the entire, um, so we are looking at the contents of uh, what appears within a box. So uh, we are looking at uh, packaging. Uh, the, there are different types of contents within a, uh, a meal kit box and we need to understand the type of packaging which we are using. So I've again highlighted um, or provided a synopsis in here. So uh, packaging material, when it comes to sourcing packaging material, we are pursuing single sourcing. Why? Because we are dealing with different types of packaging material. So it's better to deal with one single supplier rather than dealing with uh, a multitude of suppliers, which helps us with maintaining quality. And the type of packaging material which we are using, we are using an outer box, an inner chill box, an eco chill bag, and a meal kit bag. Okay, so you need not know too much about what these different types of boxes are. You just need to remember uh, the type of packaging material which you are using. So when you look at the uh, outer box, it's usually, usually a corrugated box. And this is uh, made from 100% recycled material. So we are sticking to our sustainability uh, outlook. Uh, and I highlighted our uh, sustainability initiatives carried out or implemented within the organization. Uh, so uh, I ask you to go through video number one to gain an understanding about these things. So the outer box is, uh, you, uh, you know, the, the outer box which we are using uh, uh, carries 100% recycled material and there is an inner chill box. Why? Because we need to uh, uh, ensure that uh, food items do not go bad. So there's an inner chill box which we are using and that's made out of 100% recycled material as well. And again, there's an eco chill bag, uh, uh, which we are using as well. Uh, this is not made from 100% recycled material, but co consumers can reuse these uh, eco chill bags. And we are using meal kit bags when it comes to um, uh, the packaging material pertaining to meal kit bags. Again, we are using 100% recycled material. So out of all the uh, types of uh, uh, packaging material which we are using, uh, in most instances, we are using 100% recycled or recyclable material, recycled material. And um, when it comes to eco chill bags, we are using reusable material so that customers can uh, keep using them. So we uh, that is in line with the sustainability initiatives uh, carried out by the company. And we can see that sustainable packaging is pursued. Um, and with this in mind, when we are trying to achieve sustainability, we have to be uh, concerned about the carbon emissions. So because of that, we are hell bent on purchasing from a closely located supplier uh, when it comes to uh, purchasing all these uh, packaging material. And we work closely with suppliers to develop new sustainable packing options. 
okay that's again in line with our sustainability outlook of the company and we are uh, focused on reducing carbon uh, re reducing our co2 footprint or carbon emissions and uh, improvements are pursued with regards to uh, packaging material where we are trying to use 100% recycled material as much as possible reducing plastic content because especially when uh, uh, preparing meal kits definitely there would be plastic content so the company is trying to reduce uh, uh, the use of plastic content as much as possible uh, the company wants to use biodegradable material and uh, the company uses multiple use eco chill bags so that a customer as i told you earlier the customer can keep on reusing the eco chill bag into the future so uh, by looking at the packaging material again i want to highlight that uh, uh, we are trying to achieve sustainability uh, by sourcing packaging material from a sustainable source right then um, information is provided pertaining to the distribution which occurs within the organization. Distribution is handled by a third party. It's outsourced to a uh, major distributor. Why? Usually because this is a, this might be because uh, our company is small. And on top of that, uh, we believe in uh, reducing emissions in distribution in such a context. Rather than us handling distribution, it's better to, uh, you know, give that responsibility to a specialist. Because the specialists can, uh, since uh, they have a good understanding about the distribution industry, they can come up with ways and means of reducing carbon emissions or uh, handling distributions in the most efficient manner. So I see this in a positive light. Uh, and uh, looking at uh, the type of vehicles used by our major distributors, uh, there's a fleet of delivery vehicles used out of which 75% are diesel powered and 25% of the vehicles are electric or biogas powered. Uh, I'm highlighting the fact that uh, uh, the company, the delivery services provider using 75% uh, diesel powered vehicles, it's not in line with meals at homes sustainability objectives. Okay, uh, maybe because of that, the distributor has a five-year aim of um, making sure that 90% of vehicles to be electric or biogas powered, maybe, maybe probably because of uh, uh, the type of pressure coming from our company as well as any other company this distributor is working with. Uh, be prepared to discuss the pros and cons of outsourcing. Uh, there could be a situation where the examiner is looking at uh, in-house production. They, you know, I've, uh, you know, make or buy decisions, you call it under P1. Uh, so I've uh, prepared a question. I've included a, a question pertaining to make or buy decisions in that um, I've uh, mentioned about outsourcing. So there's nothing to worry about. And uh, an inefficiency in distribution can affect our reputation adversely, just like uh, uh, you know, the ingredient suppliers, I said, we have to rely on high quality ingredient suppliers, we need to have collaborative relationships with them. Uh, why? Because our reputation depends on the type or the quality of uh, ingredients which we provide to our customers within our meal kits. And the same should be said about the quality of distribution as well. Because if there's uh, any type of uh, inefficiency within distribution, uh, our customers will end up getting dissatisfied and uh, our customers won't be too concerned about whether we had outsourced distribution or not, because the, the dealing is between us and the customer, not between the distribution provider and the customer. So we have to make sure that this uh, chosen distribution provider uh, works in line with uh, uh, the needs of uh, meals at home. And on top of that, it's better if we can push this distributor to adopt sustainability within its uh, company operations uh, because they have too many diesel powered vehicles. And real life examples pertaining to uh, high flyers in the distribution industry are DHL and FedEx. Uh, if you consider a company, I'm just giving a real life example uh, to highlight the importance of using uh, um, high quality distributors. If you look at a company such as Toyota, which believes in Kaizen, continuous improvement, zero defects, uh, zero rework. They believe in total quality management. So uh, Toyota focus on, focuses on utmost levels of achieving utmost levels of quality. So because of that, 
they had selected the best uh, uh, logistic services provider out there, uh, which is DHL. So likewise, when selecting our distributor uh, distributors, we have to make sure that they uh, stick to our sustainability objectives or they are in line with our sustainability objectives and uh, they know what type of uh, quality we expect out of them. And looking at the employees, we have uh, a total of 500 employees. So that's exactly why I said that this is a smaller uh, company uh, relative to uh, the type of companies you'd see in uh, the management case study or the strategic case study. Uh, out of all our uh, employees, the majority works in the uh, production facility and only 62 employees work in the head office uh, that is typical of the company dynamics. Right, so uh, information has been provided about uh, the costing initiatives carried out within the company as well as the type of budgets used. So the company is using standard costing um, standard absorption costing is used and um, uh, uh, the absorption basis which we are using are direct labor hours and direct machine hours. Uh, you might be wondering as to why the company is using uh, two different absorption bases because we have uh, automated within our production facility, we have automated operations as well as uh, labor intensive operations, especially when it comes to box packing that's uh, highly labor intensive. So because of that, we are using different types of uh, absorption bases. So if it's uh, machine centric, we are using direct machine hours as our absorption base. And if it's uh, labor centric, then we are using labor hours as our absorption base. So you are supposed to go through the pros and cons and relevance to uh, 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 meals at home with regards to absorption costing and any other different type of costing methodology the company can adopt, okay? So you need to understand the pros and cons of, uh, for, uh, for instance, marginal costing, absorption costing, activity-based costing, and likewise. And on top of that, whether uh, uh, each type of costing methodology is applicable to the internal dynamics of the company, uh, again, uh, I will be highlighting these uh, points uh, later on in video number uh, four, when I'm doing the financial analysis. And on top of that, when preparing mock exams, I've uh, inculcated these areas where I've uh, asked you to uh, highlight the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages of different costing systems, as well as uh, whether each costing system is applicable to meals at home. And uh, the company is uh, be prepared to evaluate other costing systems such as marginal costing, throughput costing, and activity-based costing as I highlighted earlier. And the company uses standard cost costing. That's why they are using standard cost cards. And these standard cost cards are updated twice a year. Uh, so when you are updating your standard cost cards uh, uh, twice a year, definitely, variances will be there. So variances will definitely be tested in your examination. So uh, that's a P1 related area. Again, there's absolutely nothing to worry because I've come up with uh, uh, questions covering all types of variances uh, which can be tested in your exam. And looking at uh, budgeting, the type of budgeting adopted within the organization, we are using uh, the imposed budget, uh, uh, budgeting style uh, which results in limited participation. Uh, why? Because an imposed style is a situation where uh, typically uh, the head office or the finance function uh, of an organization comes up uh, with a budget and imposes it on the uh, other types of employees or other departments. So uh, usually when we are using absorption costing and standard costing, you would see this type of an imposed uh, uh, style of budgeting. However, that uh, comes with uh, disadvantages. Uh, there's limited ownership of budgets, so the employees won't have any type of ownership over uh, the controls, which are used to uh, 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 carry out performance evaluations. And budgets may be viewed as unachievable or too challenging. Why? Because the low-level employees who are actually implementing the plans made by the strategic level guys, the low level employees are not uh, actually involved in the, the budget setting process. So because of that, they might seem budgets to be uh, uh, 
unachievable or too challenging. Better to opt for participating participative budgeting. So you need to have a good understanding about the type of participative budgeting options out there, as well as the pros and cons of participative budgeting and be prepared to evaluate the pros and cons as I highlighted right now of the current and potential budgetary systems which can be implemented within the company. So you need to know what uh, an imposed budgeting system is and its pros and cons. Uh, you need to know uh, the nitty gritty is pertinent to zero-based budgeting, activity-based budgeting, rolling budgets, flexible budgets, and beyond, bu beyond budgeting. In all these instances or in all these areas, you need to uh, understand the pros and cons. And based on evaluating the pros and cons, you need to be able to um, uh, be in a position to suggest whether uh, we need to uh, shift to a different budgeting system based on the information provided in the examination. Again, there's absolutely nothing to worry because I've prepared questions covering all these types of budgetary systems. All right, so having said that, uh, it brings us to the end of the second video. Um, so before I wind up the session, let me talk about the, let me remind you about the four different videos which uh, we are providing. Uh, video number one consists of information pertinent to the introduction to the company. In video number two, which is this video, I uh, spoke about company operations. So I uh, spoke about the internal dynamics, the number of employees uh, working, and on top of that, uh, what happens within our production process, what happens within our warehouses, what happens within uh, um, our uh, when it comes to uh, us uh, purchasing uh, raw materials or ingredients, what type of relationships we have with our purchasing guys. Uh, and likewise, and uh, uh, what happens with regards to selling and distribution, what type of products we sell, the prices and whatnot. So all these types of information were provided. And on top of that, I, at the very end, uh, I highlighted about the type of uh, syllabus content, which can be tested as well. So that's all these things were covered in this video, which was the second video. In the next video, the third video, I'll be taking you through an industry analysis and the and in the fourth and final video, I'll be taking you through the financial statements, thereby carrying out a financial analysis.